from Rhode Island, the Steel Yard. This award is not for a single project or initiative, but to recognize the exceptional leadership and cumulative work of the organization on behalf of Providence and Rhode Island's creative economy. The Steel Yard was founded in 2001 as an industrial arts center in the outskirts of Providence. Today it has grown into a 3.8 acre campus that includes a craft school, a manufacturing studio, and a community venue that is outdoors. As you heard if you attended their workshop here at CCX, they don't just draw people to their own place where individuals, communities, neighbors, businesses, municipalities, and institutions experience the creative process. They also bring their inclusive design and public art process to other communities training local artists and championing fair uh, pay for creative work. It says on their website, and we agree, the Steel Yard has grown to be more than an arts organization. Their mission attracts community members to uh, the site every day, using it day and night as a hub for learning, working, and economic development to earn a living, place votes in local ele uh, elections, and utilize their open green space cultural events, and so much more. They are a quintessential example of the community pride and economic impact that result when hard-working artists bring people together to learn and craft beautiful objects. I would like to now invite Tim Furlan and Jenny Sparks from the Public Projects Department of the State to accept this great economy award.
you, Todd, and congratulations to the Steel Yard. Now I would like to introduce Karen Middleman, Executive Director of the Vermont Arts Council, who will present our next award. As Kathy just mentioned, NEPA is giving a second Organizational Leadership Award, award this year. This is not for a single initiative or a single project, but instead it recognizes the exceptional leadership and the cumulative work of an organization that has worked steadfastly on behalf of Vermont and Burlington's creative economy. I'm delighted to present this award to Burlington City Arts. Some of you remember that BCA was first established in 1981 by then Mayor Bernie Sanders as the all-volunteer Mayor's Arts Council. Burlington City Arts, as it's now known, or BCA, has evolved from a tiny, scrappy festival organizer into a crucial city department that keeps the arts at the heart and the center of Burlington's life. BCA has done it all when it comes to arts-based community development one of the first departments in the nation to be designated as a cultural planner. They integrate the arts into planning for economic development, education, and urban design. They have renovated and managed city facilities, including Memorial Auditorium and the Firehouse, now or BCA's house. They still produce and partner on events large and small, but also manage a wide range of stunning exhibitions, groundbreaking educational programs, calls for artists, art sales, and other artist resources. And that says nothing of the way that they've elevated the public presence for the arts everywhere in Burlington and beyond, through street festivals, concerts, and wonderful events like the Discover Jazz Festival happening right now. And of course, I can't describe the impact of BCA without giving credit to Doreen Kraft, who was the first part-time paid staff person in Mayor Bernie Sanders' office all those years ago, and now leads a staff of 18 and a nonprofit foundation that helps raise money for the municipal entity to do its work. Doreen is a tireless champion for the arts. And Doreen, we've been talking a lot over the past few days about what our special powers are. Your superpower is definitely collaboration and partnership that's so vital to keeping the arts alive in Burlington and all across Vermont. Congratulations. I would like to invite Doreen and Sarah Katz, assistant director, to the stage to accept this award. Congratulations to Burlington City Arts. Um, now we're going to give out our project award to a newer but impactful initiative in Massachusetts. And I'd like to introduce Luis Goto, Cultural District's Program Manager at the Massachusetts Cultural Council to present this year's project award. Thank you. Um, Yesterday I, I had on my community collaborator hat on, so today I'm super proud to be representing the Mass Cultural Council, hence the collar. <laughs> but I'm super psyched to be presenting this next project award to an incredible organization that I've also worked with um, in East Boston, Zoomix. And their project, Constellación de Historias. Constellación de Historias was born out of a need to gather community voices around a crucial issue, gentrification, in East Boston. Constellación de Historias used the Zoomix radio platform in partnerships with local advocacy groups and youth journalists to produce radio stories and events that gave a voice to local citizens during the City of Boston's comprehensive planning process for East Boston. 
project elements included an audio challenge to teach team, teams of youth and adults the elements of an audio story, a block party to share the collective stories through art installations, a sound walk that mapped these stories around crucial spaces undergoing change, and a story loft of live storytelling performance and zine making, all live broadcasts in Spanish on Zoomix Radio. Constelación de Historias is more than a storytelling project about the community's past. It is an effort to empower the existing community and strengthen its roots in order to reflect with an inevitable change. Connecting citizens to a city planning process and galvanizing them around creative activity might not prevent gentrification, but reinforcing the importance of free speech and intergenerational story gathering is sure to have a positive, possibly mitigating effect. I'd like to invite Brittany Thomas, Director of Creative Media and Technology at Lene Dongo, Radio Station Manager at Zoomix, on the stage to accept this award for the Constellation de Historias Padres. opportunity to attend the workshops of these recipients, you will be able to see video of their workshops courtesy of the staff at Onion River Community Access. And NEFA will be sure to share the video links in our follow-up and on our social media in the weeks to come. This is my last turn at the podium, so I am uh, both going to reintroduce Dee, but I also just want to personally thank everyone for being here, and it's been such a wonderful opportunity to hear from all of you who shared your projects and your workshops with us. I am so inspired, but we still have more, and to tell us about more and next is Dee Schneidman. Thank you, Kathy. And yes, an additional congratulations from me to the award recipients. Um, I don't get to give out grants at NEPA regularly. That is unusual. The vast majority of our staff give out grants. That's, you know, we run a lot of grant programs. So this is my opportunity to give out cash. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we are transitioning to a little early but that's cool, because you're all here, and we want to get out from this beautiful day, and enjoy Montpelier and Vermont. Um, so I'm starting to transition us into our final special session together. We wanted to have kind of an arc of activities that we all share together, as you mentioned, around this value of inclusive, creating, creative communities. And obviously, a really important um, reason for us all gathering together at a peer exchange is that we all have so much to exchange. We are resources for each other. So we've sort of entitled this um, final session, Reimagining Resources Roundup, because I like alliteration. <laughs> <laughs> and you probably noticed the names of the um, special sessions all have some alliteration. <laughs> um, so to kind of kick us off, and start off with some um, resources that are in this room, but came from maybe further than New England. Um, we have some friends from some national organizations who are going to give you a couple minutes of some important resources that you should know about, why, and how you can make use of them. And our first resource of many is Axel from Policy Link. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? 
Uh, my name is Axel Santana, coming to you from Oakland, California. I'm pretty sure I traveled farthest, so I should get an award for that. Yeah, so I'm here uh, representing Policy Link, uh, based out of Oakland, California. Policy Link is a national research and action institute advancing racial and economic equity by lifting up what works. Um, as a part of our arts and culture and equitable development work, we've developed a tool called Building a Cultural Equity Plan. Through this primarily online tool, we have adapted a form of planning that explicitly focuses on cultural equity as a dynamic, regular practice hoping to inspire a wave of cultural equity plans. This tool provides guidance and resources for agencies and communities who would like to complete a plan that is dedicated to accomplishing cultural equity in their neighborhood, city, county, or region. By pointing to equity-focused approaches of cities engaging in this practice, it serves to promote equitable development through arts and culture. For those of you wondering what even is cultural equity, to us, cultural equity explicitly values the unique and collective cultures of diverse communities and supports their existence in physical spaces, in public and policies and investments, and in their expressions within civic and spiritual life. A cultural equity plan values interculturality, the recognition and support of diverse and distinct cultures, and the bridging and sharing of those cultures to build and uh, interconnected communities, towns, and cities. It explicitly addresses legacies of structural racial discrimination and remedying of institutionalized norms that have systemic, systematically disadvantaged categories of people based on identity. Cultural equity reverses economic disinvestment to ensure healthy and living and thriving communities where people feel a sense of belonging. So with that frame in mind, some opportunities for policies in the arts and culture sector to deliver on equitable development include investing in artists of culture and artists of color and cultural organizations serving communities of color and realigning public arts and culture investments for racial equity. Also, creating strong alignment between investments by public arts and culture agencies and demographic shares of populations, as well as creating collaborations between artists and culture agencies and commissions and other key sectors to co-design, invest, and deliver on equitable development. So the tool we've developed includes some helpful considerations when planning for cultural equity, as well as links to valuable resources and examples of promising practices. Again, the goal is to help communities think about how to utilize their existing assets to improve the lives of all residents, regardless of race, ethnicity, customs, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, religion, disability, and socioeconomic or citizenship status. Key sections of this tool include resources for cultural asset mapping, tips and tools for incorporating disaggregated data, and considerations for aligning policies to achieve cultural equity goals. The City of Oakland's cultural plan is a great example of equity-focused planning, and it was adopted in July of 2018. A notable part of this plan was to build the infrastructure needed to achieve cultural equity, which included the reanimation of a cultural affairs commission focused on the vision of cultural equity. As part of the implementation process, the city has hired a handful of artists fellows from within the community to work directly with the various departments to integrate creative strategies in their work. Our tool includes references and links to the open plan and others like it from across the country. Although the most useful time to use this tool would be at the outset of your town, city, or community's cultural or comprehensive planning processes, it can also be useful in evaluating an existing plan and its effectiveness. So the earlier you start considering equity implications in your work, the better the outcomes will be for all residents of your community. So if you think your community could benefit from a cultural equity planning process, please visit plcylk.org slash cultural equity and or come up to me after this um, and I can provide you with a palm card uh, with more information. Um, so thank you and I look forward to connecting. Um, and up next we have Maura Brown from Our Place. Mara Cuffey, I'm here representing Art Place America. How many folks are familiar with Art Place? Yeah, okay, awesome. 
Um, so then you probably already know that our place is a 10-year funder collaborative. Um, we really care about creative place making and we define that in a few ways. For me, the, a meaningful definition has been artists as allies and equitable community development. Um, in our mandate um, many years ago, we were tasked with this activity called field building. One of the ways that we have done that is through knowledge, right, and network weaving. My wonderful colleague, Jamie Hand, is our director of research strategies, and she's the one who has all the tools that you all, I think, maybe have used and are building more tools that will be useful to you in the coming years that our place is here. I wanted to say a little bit about what those field scans are. That's the tool that I'm sharing with you all today. So we have, we think about arts and equitable community development in a sector sort of way. Many of you have probably seen this matrix right on the Art Place website. So what we've been doing is gathering people at the intersection of these, of these matrices, right? So what does arts do for food and agricultural systems? What does arts do for public safety? What can arts do for the environment? All of us in this room know that there's a lot, right, that we can do in all of those sectors. But these field scans do is help us translate when we're partnering right across sectors. So on our website, if you go to, I don't have it memorized the way, <laughs> the way I hold it. Yeah. So, but you can go to ourplaceamerica.org. We have a research strategy section and the whole suite of all the field scans that exist right now. Again, those field scans are about art and these other intersections or sectors of community development. Most recently, uh, we launched a field scan around food and agricultural systems, the Cummins Family Farm. If they're still here, we're a part of that work. Shout out to the Cummins Family Farm in Vermont. Um, and there you can read things that say you were trying to partner with folks um, in your region. That field scan would give you five or six outcomes, right, that you could go to your city officials, for example, who maybe don't get that parts and food and agri thing. You could say, well, look, here's this field scan that Art Place made, <laughs> right, in collaboration with all these great folks, and here are five things that we could do together. Another quick plug that Art Place uh, launched recently in collaboration with Policy Link. I only have one of these because I don't always have my act together. I'm sorry, friends. <laughs> but, I, but the website always has that together. Um, <laughs> Communitydevelopment.art um, is this really rad um, new website that categorizes a lot of the projects, right, that we know are beautiful and important um, and are growing our communities in beautiful ways. It's a repository of stories. It's a repository for documentation beyond stories. It's a repository of um, data as well. So I certainly encourage you to visit communitydevelopment.art to see some of those stories. Um, and then the first one was artplaceamerica.org and our research strategies uh, portfolio, our various field scans with a particular foot to the food and agricultural field scan. And I'm going to introduce the beautiful, wonderful Sunny Whitman, Whitman from National Arts Strategies. Okay. Hello folks, how's everybody doing? Hi. As Laura mentioned, my name is Sunny. I'm director at National Arts Strategies and we are a national and international organization and we support creative leaders who are changing the status quo in their careers, companies, and communities. And we do that through programs and through creating networks. So we have a program here in New England called Creative Community Fellows, which some of you may have heard of. We even have some creative community fellows in the room, I believe. No way here yet. But actually what I'm here to talk to you about is the resources that we have that are free and on demand and immediately available and applicable to your work. So the one I want to highlight is our arts and uh, strategy uh, Coursera course. So it's available on Coursera.com. Does everybody know about Coursera? <coughs> free online educational resources. Um, and it's also available on our website, artstrategies.org. So arts and culture strategy, the course, um, it's something that you can do at 2 a.m. in your bathrobe. If, if that's the only time that you have available, that's true for me. Um, and it's a course that is great for anybody who's starting up a project or someone who's in the middle, who's been running an organization for 10 years and wants to do some refresh on how you are potent and powerful in describing the value that your work creates for your community. 
and giving you frameworks that you can do to create a shared understanding with your partners on what the objectives and the steps towards achieving those objectives are in any partnership. I heard a lot of us talking about that yesterday. Um, tools for achieving great partnerships are definitely in demand. So this course is offered um, in collaboration with University of Pennsylvania. So I encourage everybody to go check it out. Great, that's all I have to say. <laughs>